This is the sutta that uh, we spoke about yesterday very briefly. Uh, and uh, this is called the Aganya Sutta. That we're going to look at is found in the Diga Nikaya, which is the long discourses of the Buddha, number 27 of the long discourses, uh, Aganya. And it's often translated as something like origin. Yeah, but uh, Bhante Sujato calls it the origin of the world. This is his translation of this particular sutta. And that's why it was mentioned by Jennifer yesterday, because uh, it kind of fitted with the topic that we were talking about before. Uh, it's okay, please, c please come in. <laughs> and um, th Thank you, excellent, okay. So, this uh, sutta, because yesterday we were talking about that the world has no beginning, yeah? so how does this fit with this particular sutta? And we can have a look at that now. But the answer really is that when this sutta talks about the beginning of things, what it means is like the how society evolves, yeah? how we get to the society we have now, how we evolve into the present state of affairs. Uh, and this is also quite interesting here. Yeah? Now, when you read the sutta, you will think that it is a strange sutta. It's very different from the suttas we have looked at so far, because it's more like mythology, it's like an allegory, it's like a story almost. And uh, the question often is, when we hear stories like this, or allegories like this, uh, how real are they? Uh, how seriously should we take them? Uh, and one of the points about mythology and stories is that they always have a moral to them. There's always a purpose to these stories. Uh, and sometimes it is wrong to say that they are just stories, uh, because just stories means that it's just made up, it doesn't have any meaning. Uh, very often it has a meaning. Uh, and it may point to certain habits of human thinking, it may point to certain ways in which we live our lives, uh, even though it may not be literally true. The general trend of the story may still be correct uh, and reflect correctly how we as human beings tend to live and how we deal with the world. Uh, so these stories are often very meaningful even though they may be stories. Uh, but uh, it may also be that there is more truth to that uh, than just what meets the eye as well, because this may actually also reflect the way the world evolves in a certain sense, uh, how human beings or beings tend. Uh, yeah. And uh, what it shows us, this story I can tell you straight away, it shows us how the mind tends to move towards craving, tends to move towards coarseness, uh, and become more and more coarse. And in, as we do that, uh, it also degrades the society around us. Society is a reflection of human beings. And as human beings degrade, uh, when we have more people lying in the world, when we have politicians lying too much, yeah, <coughs> There's, you know, it's just amazing, some of these politicians, we know that if we, the, the people at the top of government, at the very top of society, if they are immoral, other people start to become immoral as well. We take our cue from the people at the top of society, yeah? Like if you take like the United States, that's what I was thinking of uh, before, yeah, someone like Donald Trump, if you have a person like that at top of society, it affects everybody in a very bad way. Yeah? Because I personally, I don't think he is fit to rule the country. Yeah? He's a man who's completely out of it, really. It's just my personal opinion, but I think many people would agree with that. And uh, when you have someone like that at the top of a country, it affects everybody. Yeah? Yeah, everyone gets kind of degraded as a consequence. Everyone thinks now is a free-for-all. Everyone can lie, everyone can say whatever, and there is no consequences because of that. Uh, and this is what the Buddha says in many of his uh, suttas. He says that when the rulers are unrighteous, when they do bad things, uh, it affects everyone, layer by layer in society, and everyone else so also becomes immoral and unrighteous. And event eventually it affects the harvest and affect society in a very broad way when the tops of society are bad. So this is a little bit like that, yeah? It shows us the kind of general degradation of society as people also degrade in their morals and in their habits. So in this sense it's quite interesting sutta. So let's start out. So the very beginning, as usual, it starts out with 
Uh, so I have heard, this is Bhantasujato's translation here. At one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in the eastern monastery, in the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother. Uh, yeah, Megara's mother, that's Visaka. Uh, and she's called Megara's mother in the suttas. Uh, stilt, stilt longhouse, the stilt house is the kind of houses they had in India. And that is, uh, he has taken my translation, that is my translation of the word Pasada, a stilt house. Uh, now at that time, Vasetta and Bharadvaja were living on probation among the mendicants, among the monks, in the hope of being ordained. Yeah, so these are two Brahmins, Vasetta and Bharadvaja, and uh, they were living on probation at that time in India. If you came from another religion, you came to Buddhism, you had to live on probation for four months, the monks could check you out, yeah, whether you had the right view. That's why I'm teaching you right view now, so that when you come to the monastery, you already have right view. So then, bang, it's much easier. Yeah. Something like that, anyway. So that's, but this is basically a check out that they had right view. Because sometimes if you came from another religion, you had very kind of wrong views, and you weren't really suited to become a monastic in Buddhism. So you were on probation for four weeks. These days, you are in, the, in our monastery, you are on probation for two years before you can become a monk. Yeah? Why is that? Because well, that's, that's the way we do things. You have to be an anagarika for one year, then a novice monk for one year, and only then will we kind of let you through the eye of the needle. Very hard to become a monk in our monastery in, in Perth. Uh, you really have to have a kind of, I don't know if it's good karma or what, but anyway, it's very hard to become a monk there. Uh, in Thailand, you can go and become a monk. You can be a monk the same day. Bang! And then you are in, in brown robes and it's all done. Uh. But this is the traditional way, and because in the West, People are not really Buddhist, so it's good to have a probation, probationary period for people to really understand what they're getting themselves into. This is an ancient principle going back to the time of the Buddha. And here you have these two Brahmins living on probation. Here. And in, in the late afternoon, the Buddha came downstairs from the longhouse and was walking meditation in the open air beneath the shade of the longhouse. Vasetta saw him and said to Bharadvaja, Reverend Bharadvaja, the Buddha is walking meditation in the open air beneath the shade of the longhouse. Come, Reverend, let's go to the Buddha. Hopefully, we'll get to hear a Dhamma talk from him. Yes, Reverend, replied Bharadvaja. And so they went to the Buddha, bowed and walked beside him. <laughs> That's interesting, you're walking in meditation, some, suddenly someone is walking beside you, back and forth. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, uh, the word for uh, meditation in uh, Pali is chankama. Yeah? Uh, if you go to Thailand, they all still call that a chankama path. Yeah? It's a walking meditation path, the same word you use in the suttas. Uh. Jong, yeah, Jongrong, okay, that's the Thai pronunciation, but it's actually, it's actually the same word. It's just pronounced in the Thai way, yeah. Then the Buddha said to Vasetta, Vasetta, you are both Brahmins by birth and clan, and have gone forth from the lay life to homelessness from a Brahmin family. I hope you don't have to suffer abuse and insu insults from the Brahmins. <laughs> so the, you can imagine if you were a Brahmin, you would be very proud, then thought of themselves as the highest caste, and then if someone from your caste then go forth, yeah, because they are so proud, they will abuse you. Yeah, you, why are you going to those low, those samanas, yeah, those uh, whatever. And you, in a second you'll see what sort of thing they were saying. Yeah. Actually, sir, the Brahmins do insult and abuse us uh, with their typical insults to the fullest extent. But how do the Brahmins insult you? Sir, the Brahmins say, only Brahmins are the highest caste, the other castes are inferior. Only Brahmins are the light caste, the other castes are dark. Only Brahmins are purified, not others. Only Brahmins are Brahma's rightful sons or children, born of his mouth, born of Brahma, created by Brahma, heirs of Brahma. 
You've both abandoned the best cars to join an inferior cast, uh, namely these shavelings, these fake ascetics, this riffraff, uh, this black spawn of the feet of our kinsmen. Uh, this is not right, it is not proper. Uh, the black spawn from the feet of our kinsmen, that sounds pretty bad. So what does it mean? <laughs> What it means, the kinsman is the Brahma himself, because the Brahma is the kinsman, yeah, the relative of the Brahmins. Uh, so all the other the, the ascetics were considered born from his feet. Feet is very low. Yeah? Feet is the lowest thing. That's why you don't point your feet towards the Buddha statue. This goes all the way back to the time of the Buddha. The feet are considered the dirty part of the body. You walk around barefoot, it's bad. The head is the best. Yeah? So they're born from his mouth. That is what the Brahmins are. And then they, they say the Kshatriyas, the, the aristocrats, they're born from his chest. And then you have the, I think the uh, Vesas, they're born from the thighs or something like that. And then the the kind of really bottom, which is like the Samanas, they're born from the soles of the feet of Brahma. That is considered the worst. Uh, so they are, you know, the Brahmins are really kind of disparaging the Samanas, the ascetics, including the Buddha. That is how the Brahmins insult us. And then there is a long conversation. I'm not going to read all of this because we're going to be here for a long time if I read everything. Uh, so it's a long sutta. But then, then there's a long conversation between Buddha and these two Brahmins about whether the Brahmin caste really is the best or not. And the Buddha points out, as he often does, that well, everyone can get purified. Everyone can be kind. Everyone can purify their mind. And if that is so, what is really the difference? In fact, according to Buddhism, it is whether you purify yourself that makes you superior. A pure person is better than a person who is immoral. That is how you decide whether someone is good quality or not. Uh, yeah, actually, w whether you get reborn into a high family or not is irrelevant. Forget about this, all this status nonsense. Uh, that doesn't matter in Buddhism. When you come into the Sangha, everyone is one. There is no distinction within the Sangha anymore. All these class differences, all these status things is annulled once you become a Sangha member. This is one of the wonderful things about becoming a Sangha member. Everyone is then regarded as the same, at least in theory, that's the ideal. So they have a long discussion about this. <coughs> and I'm not, again, I'm uh, just going to skip that long discussion because uh, it's just too much. Uh, he talks about the king, uh, Pasenadi, having uh, faith in the Buddha and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then, after all of that, then comes the part of the Aganya Sutta that we really want to talk about and that we were referring to yesterday. Yeah. And this is how it starts. So the Buddha is still talking to the same Brahmin students. Uh, there comes a time when Vasettas, uh, after a very long period has passed, uh, this cosmos contracts. Yeah? So this is the beginning of this. There comes a time after a very long time has passed. This cosmos contracts. So in a sense, instead of starting the universe, it doesn't begin the universe. Yeah? It's almost like it comes at the end of the universe. Something has happened before, we don't know what that is. And now it kind of uh, starts again. Yeah? The cosmos contracts uh, and this is where it begins. Uh, so it doesn't say anything about the beginning. It rather says, after a certain amount of time, this is what happens. Uh, it's almost the opposite of talking about beginnings. Uh, and uh, Adan Sudato translates it as cosmos. The, the word he translates as cosmos is loka, and loka quite literally means the world. Uh, yeah, so the word world in loka in Pali is a very broad word, which means very similar to what we mean by world in the in English language. Uh, when we say the world in English language, it can mean many different things. Uh, it can mean the whole planet, Earth, it can mean be the world. It can mean humanity. If you say the whole world thinks in a certain way, it means the whole of humanity. Yeah? You can say the world to mean the universe or the cosmos. Uh, so the word world is very flexible in English and it's exactly the same flexibility in the Pali. Uh, so here it, it says that there comes a point when this cosmos contracts. Contracts is the word sangvatati. So the word sangvatati is derived from the word vat. The word vat means to roll, quite literally. Yeah? 
Is it, is it rolling? If you think of the English word evolve, yeah, evolve, what does that come from? That comes from a volve. The word volve is a Latin word which also means to roll. Yeah, if you, do you know the car Volvo? Yeah, that comes from that. Volvo, it means to roll. Yeah, that's why it's a car. It's called Volvo because cars roll. Yeah, that's kind of obvious. <laughs> so, evolve is exactly the same kind of word as sangvatati. Or actually, sangvatati means to, to roll together. Evolve means to roll out. Evolution is a rolling out of things. So, it's exactly the same idea. So, uh, here we have the kind of evolution and then the devolution or the contraction if you like of something we don't know exactly what it is he says that the world evolves and then the world disintegrates afterwards we don't know whether he means the cosmos or not but it seems quite likely that that's what it means yeah similar to modern ideas of the big bang and if you look at the suttas this idea of sangvatati and vivatati which is evolution and dissolution or evolution and devolution uh, uh, they occur over very very large time spans in the suttas uh, these are called kappas and kappa is usually translated as an eon into english uh, so quite likely they refer to something similar that we find in the modern world when we talk about the big bang and then maybe the big crunch afterwards yeah this kind of back and forth this rolling around from one universe to another one so i think this translation is okay it is not 100 percent sure that's what it means but it seems quite likely there isn't really any other good way of interpreting this so comes when this cosmos contracts, yeah, the cosmos is contracting. This is after the Big Bang, it kind of maybe reverses and starts to contract again. Uh, is that what's going to happen to the universe? Well, it's still an open question among cosmologists, but I reckon that's what we're going to see down the track. Yeah. As the cosmos contracts, sentient beings are mostly headed for the realm of streaming radiance. Street, the realm of streaming radiance is the Abhasara realm, it is equivalent to the second jhana. So this is where you go, yeah, the second jhana realm. And it is, this is a very interesting sentence in the Pali, if you know the Pali well. In Sangvattamane loke yebuyena satta Abhasara Sangvattanika Honti. It doesn't say that beings are reborn, there's no word that which means rebirth. It just says that beings go to this place when the world is contracting. And the idea behind this is that when the world is contracting, the world is destroyed. Yeah, If you are a human being, when the cosmos is contracting, what's going to happen? Well, you can't really live on this planet anymore when the universe is contracting, so you have to go somewhere where you can go. And according to Buddhist ideas, this is one of the few realms that are not destroyed when the world contracts. So you go there, you haven't really been reborn there because you haven't got the karma, but there's nowhere else to go, so kind of you, you go to this particular place. It's a strange idea, I don't really know how to understand it, because how can you go to the second jhana realm unless you have the karma to go there? I don't really, must admit, I don't really understand that. Uh, I asked Ajahn Brahm about this once and he, I don't think he was quite sure either what was going on in this particular case. But the idea is that there's nowhere else to go, so that's how you end up there. Uh, what happens when you go to the second jhana realm? Well, this is what happened. This is what the second jhana realm is like. Uh, there they are, mind made feeding on rapture, self-luminous, moving through the sky, steadily glorious, and there they remain like that for a very long time. So that's what it is like to be in the jhana realm. Mind made, feeding on rapture, piti bhakka. Your food is rapture, your food is joy, your food is bliss. That's what you feed on, that's what sustains you in that realm, just feeling bliss upon bliss upon bliss. What do you think about that? You want to go there? If you don't make it all the way to Nibbana, it's a good kind of alternative, isn't it? <laughs> stopover, is it? Is that <laughs> so you can go on for a stopover there, just for a kind of hang out there for a while, maybe on your way out to full Nibbana. Sounds quite nice. You're feeding on bliss. No need for any other food except bliss, pity. 
self luminous yeah you are you are visible on your own there's no other light needed because you are luminous that's what the devas are deva is derived from the word diva which means day so the devas are luminous beings yeah, especially the higher ones in the jhana realms moving through the sky glorious and re remain like that for a very long time and sometimes they remain like that for an eon but these beings don't remain there for an eon and the reason is because they haven't got the kama they will get reborn as soon as the universe starts to evolve again and there's possibility of going somewhere else they will go somewhere else because they haven't got the kama there comes a time when after a very long period has passed this cosmos expands as the cosmos expands sentient beings mostly pass away from that realm of the radiant deities and come back to this realm. Here they are mind-made, feeding on rapture, self-luminous, moving through the sky, steadily glorious, and they remain like that for a very long time. So they pass away because the world is expanding and then of course the cosmos comes into being again yeah, with all the planets and everything yeah. and then uh, these realms start to appear and when the realms appear that is where they get reborn uh, yeah? so this realm, what he says here coming back to this realm, what does it mean by this realm? There obviously is not a human being yeah? they are self, still self-luminous, feeling and joy and all of that uh, so what does it mean by this realm? and to understand this you have to understand a little bit about how Buddhist cosmology works uh. According to Buddhist cosmology, the Buddha talks about the various loka datus. Yeah, uh, loka is world, datu is like element. So loka datu, I would translate as a solar system. And the reason why it looks like a solar system is because the Buddha says a loka datu is the sun, the earth, and the moon. That's almost like a solar system, isn't it? Except it doesn't talk about all the other planets, but it's basically a solar system. And then he says, it is that plus all the beings that live in dependence on that solar system. What are those beings? Well, human beings live in dependence on that solar system, but not just human beings. Also, all the lower deities, deva realms, also are in dependence on that solar system. So, in any solar system, you have the human beings, you have the Chattu Maharajika Devas, the four great kings, you have the Tavatingsa Devas, yeah, the next kind of level up, then you have the Yama Devas, then you have the Tusita, the contented Devas, then you have the Nimitta Rati Devas, the ones who delight in creation, then you have the Paranimitta Vasavati Devas, the ones who like to control the creations of others, and then you have the lower Brahma realm also in. Uh, conjunction with that particular solar system yeah so every solar system has all of these realms connected to it so when people ask you uh, ask you where are you know that's a question sometimes you get well if there are devas where are they well the answer is they're right here yeah except that you can't see them uh, because their bodies are different uh, they are more subtle uh, but actually they are right here. If you had a divine eye, if you were able to see, you were able to see all these beings probably right here present. Petas, Devas and all of these other things. So they are all, all of these are actually living in dependence of the same kind of solar system. So it's wonderful. What is the GPS locations? <laughs> what is the GPS location here? Of Dewa. What is the, what is the GPS location here? Use the handphone. What what is it here? Yeah, so so if it's right here, so do you just type in BGF center and then you are you are right there? Yeah, that's the GPS location you need. That's what I mean by right here. Right? Don't need to go anywhere else. I'm about the devils. Yeah, that's 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 what I'm saying. Oh, they are here. That's what I'm saying. Okay, good. Yeah? same one. No d no different. Yeah, <laughs> same GPS location here. So. Yeah, the reason you don't see them is because they are, uh, they have a different kind of physical body. They will perceive this same location different from us because what they will see is different things. Uh, yeah, they won't see the same thing because of that fine materiality. But it is all bound together somehow. It all belongs to the same solar system. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so that's, this is the answer. Actually, they don't, they're not anywhere else in terms of space. They are just in a different kind of material reality, and that's why you can't see them. Uh, the mind, a mind-made reality instead of a physical coarse reality that we have. Uh, so this, so, so this is why it is called coming back to this realm, yeah, because these, they are, have been disappeared from the second jhana realm. If you get reborn in the second jhana realm, then you're moving outside of our solar system and you go to a higher realm, maybe the galaxy or something like that. You become maybe the lord of the galaxy. Yeah. Is that a nice idea to be the lord of the galaxy? Yeah. <laughs> If you want real power, yeah, it's not enough to have power on the earth, yeah, let's face it, that's only a small kind of thing, yeah? If you want real power, you have to have the power over the entire galaxy or something like that. And actually, that's possible according to the suttas. You can become the king of the whole, or the queen of the whole universe. The higher up you are as a deva, the more kind of you encompass, start to encompass everything, yeah? And you become like the lord of the whole universe, perhaps. So if you are very power hungry, that's the way. To go, uh, wouldn't recommend it, but that's kind of that's just uh, it just follows from this kind of uh, the way that the uh, Buddhist universe is explained. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Think it's true? Uh, <laughs> uh, why not? Uh, yeah, I think it's true. I think that's how it works. Uh, yeah. Why shouldn't it not be true? Uh, and uh, so. Uh, because some, you know, obviously the more elevated you are as a person, you can see that in our, even in the human realm, yeah, some, some people are very elevated, they end up as kings or whatever. If, you, if you're even more purified, you go higher up, you have even more power, and you kind of expand that power, eventually you, you are kind of the, because your mind is so broad, it encompasses the whole universe, like the Brahmas. Uh, so you can see why that might be the case. Anyway, so, yeah, please, okay. If that's the case, can we be born in another galaxy, another universe where there's living beings as well, like aliens and all? Is is that is are we just limited to just humans or? You want to be reborn as an alien? Huh? Let me. Yeah, good. <laughs> can we finish the sutra first before questions? Otherwise, we'll be here asking questions. Yeah. Okay, you have a point because the sutta is quite long. So maybe, can, can you come back to that one this, uh, afterwards? There's only a little bit of time between and we can come back to questions. That's a good idea because it is quite a, it's quite a lot to do. So, um, uh, you remain there for a long time because still it is a very high realm. This is like the highest realm that is connected with the present solar system, if you like. Then uh, it goes on. but. Uh, it says then that, but the single mass of water at that time was utterly dark. Now it brings up a mass of water which is obviously can connect it to this earth, uh, connect it to the solar system somehow. Uh, the moon and sun were not found, uh, nor were the stars and constellations, day and night, months and fortnights, uh, years and seasons, or male and female, beings were simply known as beings. Uh, so none of these things actually existed. Uh, yeah? Why didn't they exist? And remember, now we are in the Brahma Loka. In the Brahma Loka, you are beyond the senses. So, because you are beyond the senses, none of these things would really exist. You don't really have light, you don't have the stars, you don't have any of these things. Yeah? Uh, Brahma Loka, there's no male and female, they're just beings. So, because you are in Brahma Loka, these things haven't really arisen yet. They come later on. This mass of water, which is utterly dark, I'm not sure exactly what that is supposed to refer to, uh, but it just means, presumably, that there is darkness. Yeah? The only luminosity you have is the self-luminosity of the beings that are flying through the air. That's how you kind of, that's like the luminosity you have in samadhi. Yeah? The mind is luminous, uh, but there is no external luminosity apart from that. Uh, so you can take this to be a way of talking about the Brahma Loka prior to the further development of the universe, which comes later on. After a very long period had passed, solid nectar curdled in the water. It appeared just like curd on top of hot milk as it cools. It was beautiful, fragrant and delicious, like ghee or butter, and it was 
and it was as, as sweet as pure manuka honey. So gradually the universe is kind of expanding, so the universe is kind of coming into existence uh, and the first part of the universe is this uh, very high aspects of the universe. Uh, you can imagine that here you're talking about the very highest part of the sensual realm. This is how the sensual realm, the world appears to the highest devas. Everything appears very sweet and very beautiful. Human beings are not even thought about yet. Yeah? So don't think about this from a human perspective. Think of it as from a perspective of the high deva realms. Uh, that is the right way of thinking about this. Uh, the world is gradually appearing. This is how they see the world appearing in those high deva realms. Uh, it's sweet, it's beautiful, everything is nice. Manuka honey is like very expensive honey from New Zealand. Yeah, super duper expensive apparently. Yeah. Now, one of those beings was reckless. Reckless, the Pali is Lola Jataka. Lola means something like greedy, yeah? Greedy, wanton. You kind of, maybe they lost their cool. When you are in Brahma Loka, you're supposed to be very cool, huh? but maybe getting a bit restless, yeah? Staying in the Brahma Loka for too long. Yeah? So they were a little bit on the edge of the Brahma Loka, not fully absorbed in the first jhana, but kind of outside. Brahma's retinue or something like that, they called it in the suttas. Yeah? So getting a bit, little bit greedy, thinking, Oh my, what might this be? They tasted the solid nectar with their finger. They enjoyed it and craving was born in them. And other beings following that being's example tasted solid nectar with their fingers. They too enjoyed it and craving was born in them. So what you are seeing here is like the descent of beings, how beings get coarser, how they get corrupted by the world outside of them. They see all of these beautiful things and because they lose their contentment after a while, if you've been in jhana for too long, after a while think, jeepers, I'm kind of fed up of being in jhana. Yeah, I'm actually, you, I don't think you ever think that, but they get a bit restless after a while because they've stayed in this realm for so long. Yeah? And they think, is there anything else we can do? Huh? And then they move to some lower pleasure, because simply out of curiosity or whatever, and then craving arises. They become more coarse as beings as this happens. And as they do that, they kind of sink down the hierarchy of the universe. They were in Brahma Loka before, but now gradually they're moving into the sensual realm, maybe the Padanimita Vasavati or whatever, gradually moving into that, becoming core. It's like the descent of man or humanity, yeah? Uh, getting corrupted in a certain way, coming from purity, now getting corrupted. Huh? So this is a metaphor, remember this is a metaphor in a large part for what happens to us as human beings. Huh? Yeah, if you allow your mind to just stray all the time, uh, if you are not careful and guard your mind and guard your senses, uh, very what often what happens is that your desire are endless. So they keep on going out, doing new things. Uh, and in that process of going out and doing, no, uh, doing new things, uh, it also gets coarser. Uh, yeah, the kind of things that people get up to in the world in the pursuit of pleasure often can be quite coarse and as you pursue the course it gets even worse and eventually you end up doing things that are really quite bad yeah because you're pursuing pleasures in the wrong way and this so this is a metaphor for what happens to us as human beings unless we restrain ourselves unless we go against the grain and this is why buddhism is said to go be a, a, a teaching that goes against the stream you have to go against the stream of craving, because if you don't, you get dragged on by these uh, delusions of ours, uh, and then you end up doing things that are very coarse after a while. Uh, here we see that coarseness happening, yeah, in the same way. Yeah. Um, so then they enjoyed it too, and craving was born in them, the beginning of coarseness. Uh, then those beings started to eat the solid nectar, breaking it into lumps. And when they did this, their luminosity vanished. They are losing some of their qualities, some of those marvelous qualities because they're becoming more coarse. Yeah? The, the luminosity of the body vanishes. The mind loses its luminosity. And I'm sure you know what that means to some extent. When you become peaceful, 
and calm, sometimes the mind brightens up. Yeah, the mind becomes bright. And the deeper you go in samadhi, the more you do, the brighter the mind is. And then you come back to the ordinary life again and you enjoy the pleasures of the world. That brightness is gone. The brightness and the coarseness of the mind are inverses of each other. And here you can see what happens. This is exactly what happens in our meditation practice. You can see here happening to beings also out there in the, in the real life. Because states of rebirth are equivalent to mental states. Yeah? These are not different. So mental states and states of rebirth can mirror each other. And that's why you can see this happening also in the world at large. So the luminosity vanishes. And with the vanishing of the luminosity, the moon and the sun appeared. The stars and constellations appeared. Days and nights were distinguished. And so were the months and the fortnights, the years and the seasons. To this extent, the world had evolved once more. The universe is expanding, the sun and the moon come back, the beings are becoming more coarse, so they are now starting to perceive these things yeah, as they appear in the world, and things are kind of moving in that direction. Now the light is external, it is no longer your mind, it is no longer sufficient, now we have an external light instead. Then those beings eating the solid nectar with, their, uh, with that as their food and nourishment remained for a very long time. But so long as they ate that solid nectar, their bodies became more solid and they diverged in appearance. Gradually, as the craving goes on, the body becomes more solid. They start to get a different kind of body. This is the point I was making before about the body that we have as beings varies enormously. If you have an out-of-body experience, you still have a body, but it's a refined kind of body compared to what you have as a human being. And these bodies can vary a lot depending on the realm that you have been reborn in. So here the bodies are gradually becoming more and more coarse, moving towards a human body eventually. Yeah? The craving and all those defilements are making life more coarse, including the physical body. So, so they, and then they diverged in appearance. Yeah? Before they probably all looked the same. Yeah? They were all kind of just very happy, just have meta for each other. There was no kind of difference between them. Now they diverge in appearance. Some were beautiful, some ugly. And the beautiful beings looked down on the ugly ones. We are more beautiful. They, uh, they are the ugly ones. <laughs> And the vanity of the beautiful ones made the solid nectar vanish. Now you see more defilements come into the picture. You become vain, you become kind of proud of your appearance. You think that you are special because of whatever physical attribute or whatever. And then because of that, yeah, again, those beautiful qualities of the heavenly realms, uh, where you have special pleasures, they start to vanish. Uh, with the coarseness of the body, with the uh, defilements in the mind, they vanish. And you can see again, it mirrors the idea what happens in meditation and how beings are reborn. The more pure your mind is, the higher is your rebirth. And here you can see that descent yeah, from one realm to another one as a result of the defilements. They gathered together and bemoaned, oh, what a taste, oh, what a taste. Yeah, they lost that taste, oh no, the taste is gone, or something like that, is the kind of the Pali here. Aho rasang, aho rasang is the Pali, rasa is taste. Aho is like bemoaning, oh no, the taste, oh, gee, it's gone, we had all this, we had this, whatever it is, I don't know. We had this wonder good noodles, I don't know if you, people like noodles here, but uh, whatever is nice is, is disappeared. Uh. And even to today, when people get something tasty, they say, oh, what a taste, oh, what a taste. They are just remembering the ancient traditional saying, but they don't understand what it means. So basically, this is like the universal way of thinking about things. When the solid nectar had vanished, ground sprouts appeared to those beings. They appeared just like mushrooms. They were beautiful, fragrant and delicious, like ghee or butter. And they were sweet and pure, like manuka honey. Then those beings started to eat the ground sprouts, 
With that as their food and nourishment, they remained for a very long time. But so long as they ate those ground sprouts, their bodies became more solid and they diverged even more in appearance, some beautiful, some ugly. And the beautiful beings looked down on the ugly ones. We're more beautiful, they are the ugly ones. And the vanity of the beautiful ones made the ground sprouts vanish. When the ground sprouts had vanished, bursting pods appeared, like the fruit of the kadam, kadam tree. Kadam tree, okay. They were, I don't know what that is, but anyway. They were beautiful, fragrant and delicious, like a ghee and butter. And they were as sweet as pure manuka honey. There's lots of manuka honey here. But uh, <laughs> then those beings started to eat the bursting pods. With that as their food and nourishment, they remained for a very long time. But so long as they ate those burst, bursting pods, their bodies became more solid and they diverged in appearance, some beautiful and some ugly. And the beautiful beings looked down on the ugly ones. We are more beautiful, they are the ugly ones. And the vanity of the beautiful ones made the bursting pods vanish. They gathered together and bemoaned, Oh, what we have lost! Oh, what we have lost! Those bursting pods! And even today, when people experience their say, suffering, they say, Oh, what we have lost! Oh, what we have lost! They are just remembering an ancient traditional teaching, saying, but they don't understand what it means. So, ancient traditional saying basically just means that samsara has always been like this. It has never been any different. Always the same kind of suffering appears to humanity and it even appears to the devas. Yeah, these aren't obviously devas. They also have the suffering when they have all these nice things and they go. Devas are not that different from human beings. This is part of the problems we're getting reborn in devaloka. Yes, you enjoy it a little bit more, yes, you have a bit more fun, but ultimately you too have to suffer very similar consequences as you suffer in the human realm. There is no escape. Help! Yeah, and then you, <laughs> then you start to want to move away from this, because you understand that it's all, everything, it's uh, uh, fully... Uh, this kind of suffering is just everywhere, it can't, can't escape it in samsara. When the bursting pods had vanished, a ripe, untilled rice appeared to those beings. It had no powder or husk, pure and fragrant, fragrant with only the rice grain. When they, what they took for supper in the evening, by the morning had grown back and ripened, and what they took for breakfast in the morning had grown back and ripened by the evening, so the cutting didn't show. Then those beings eating the ripe, untilled rice uh, with that as food and nourishment remained for a very long time. But so long as they ate that ripe, untilled rice, their bodies became more solid and they diverged in appearance. Uh, and female characteristics appeared on women, while male characteristics appeared on men. Women spent too much time gazing at the men and the men at the women. Uh, and they became lustful, and their bodies burnt with fever. Due to this fever, they had sex with each other. Those who saw them having sex pelted them with dirt, ash and cow dung, saying, Get lost, filth! Get lost, filth! How on earth can one being do that to another? And even today, people in some countries, when a bride is carried off, they pelt her with dirt, ashes and cow dung. Is that right? <laughs> I know that when the sometimes what happens when the bride gets carried off, they, they throw kind of rice, it's a very common thing, or confetti or something like that. I don't know, cow dung, is that happened today? I'm not sure if anyone gets, that was a bit kind of harsh to get, you just get married and you get all this cow dung over you, it sounds a bit too, too much. <laughs> so, um, but still, they are just remembering an ancient traditional saying but they don't understand what it means. So again, this more of the same, yeah? Things get more and more coarse, more and more solid, and as you do that, more and more differences and distinctions appear between people, 
and uh, more stronger and stronger desires and as you do that the coarseness happens and maybe part of that is the cow dung is maybe part of the kind of coarseness uh, what was reckoned as immoral at that time these days is reckoned as moral uh, the beings who had sex together weren't allowed to enter a village or town for one or two months uh, ever since they excessively threw themselves into immorality uh, they started to make buildings to hide their immoral deeds. Then one of those beings of idle disposition thought, Hey now, why should I be bothered to gather rice in the evening for supper and in the morning for breakfast? Why don't I gather rice for supper and breakfast all at once? So, and, and that's what they did. So, where are we now? And we are now probably in some of the lower devalokas. Yeah, the lower devalokas are very similar to the human realm. You start to see a lot of similarities here with how we live in the human realm. Villages and towns and men and women, yeah, or maybe rather male and female rather, not really men and women, but they're devas. Uh, and so you see this happening, yes, yeah? so they're still devas, they're still gathering this rice. Uh, so it's the still from that devaloka posture that we're seeing. It's still not incredibly coarse, but it's gradually moving towards more and more coarseness. Uh, the mind is getting coarse, the world is getting coarse with it. Uh, we create the world according to what our minds is like. This is re really what this means. Yeah? And this is how kamma and rebirth works. You create that next world that you go to through your mind, the purity of your mind. Uh, then one of the other beings approached that being and said, Come, good being, let's go to gather rice. There is no need, good being. I gathered rice for supper and breakfast all at once. So that being, following their example, also gathered rice for two days all at once. Well, actually for two days now, thinking, this is fine. Then one of the other beings approached that being and said, Come, good being, we shall go to gather rice. There is no need, good being, I gathered rice for two days all at once. So that being, following their example, gathered rice for four days all at once, thinking, This seems fine. Then one of the other beings approached that being and said, Come, good being, let's go and gather rice. There is no need, good being, I gathered rice for four days all at once. So that being followed their example, gathered rice for eight days all at once, thinking, this seems fine. But when they started to store up rice to eat, the rice grains became wrapped in powder and husk and didn't grow back after reaping. The cutting showed and the rice stood in clumps. So getting more coarse. Powder and husk means that instead of just having a pure rice grain, uh, yeah, now you have it enveloped in husk and things like that. Much more work to clean it up and get the rice out. Uh, so everything getting more coarse. Uh, it doesn't grow back as fast. Uh, and it, all of this is in, as a result of the greed of those beings. You can see greed growing. Uh, so far there is no, not much hatred or anger, so far it's mostly greed and desire that we see. So still fairly small defilements in comparison, yeah? Nothing very coarse so far, uh, but still everything is reacting, the environment is reacting to the mental state that we are in. Uh. Then those beings gathered together and bemoaned, Oh, how wicked things have appeared among us, uh, among beings. Uh, for we used to be mind-made, feeling or rapture self-luminous, uh, moving through the sky, steadily glorious, uh, and we remained like that for a very long time. Uh, after a very long period had passed, solid nectar curdled in the water. And then they remembered the whole sequence, yeah, everything that happened. Uh, and this is very abbreviated here in Adan Sudato's translation. But due to bad, unskillful things among us, the savory nectar vanished, the ground sprouts vanished, the bursting pods vanished, and now the rice grains have become wrapped in powder and husk. It doesn't grow back after reaping. The cutting shows and the rice stands in clumps. We'd better divide up the rice and set boundaries. And that's what they did. Now one of those beings being reckless or really greedy is probably better here, 
while guarding their own share, took another person's share without being given it and ate it. Stealing, exactly. Now stealing is happened for the very first time. Yeah? Now it's starting to get really coarse and really bad. They grabbed that one who had done this and said, you have done a bad thing, good being, in that while guarding your own share, you took another's share without it being given and ate it. Do not do such a thing again. Yes, sir, replied that being. But for a second time and a third time they did the same thing and were told not to continue. And then they struck that being, some with fists, others with stones, and still others with rods. And from that day on stealing from that day on stealing was found and blaving and lying and the taking up of rods. The evolution of immorality gradually, gradually getting coarser and coarser. Huh? how the mind tends to move towards these things almost automatically unless there is restraint. This is how what happens in the mind. You steal, then you lie, then you blame and then you start to punish. Yeah? And of course once you start punishing with rods, the taking up of rods here, danda dana really means punishing, I think is a better way of translating that because danda is punishment. Yeah, and of course with that also is the defilements of anger and hatred and all of these things that are coming with that. You can't really punish someone without being angry and upset. So it's a parable for how the mind tends to move and how that also then affects the society around us. Then those beings gathered together and bemoaned. Oh, how wicked things have appeared among beings, in that stealing is found, and blaming, and lying, and punishment. Why don't we elect one being who would rightly accuse those who deserve accusation, blame those who deserve to be blamed, and expel those who deserve to be expelled? And we shall pay them with a share of rice. So this is where kind of the election comes, yeah, the Pali word here for uh, elect someone is samanati, and samanati is really agree on a particular being. Uh, that's what it really means. Uh, so we can agree together, it's a bit like electing, yeah, because everyone agrees, uh, and then you choose this being to meet out the punishment and to look after these things. Uh, this is the how you do it, and then you pay them, yeah, you give, give them a salary for doing that. Uh, then those beings approached the being among them who was the most attractive, good-looking, lovely and illustrious and said, Come good being, rightly accuse those who deserve it, blame those who deserve that and banish those who deserve that and we shall pay you with a share of rice. Yes sirs, replied that being and they acted accordingly and were paid with a share of rice. Elected by the people, Vasetta, is the meaning of the elected one, the elected one, Maha Samato, one who is elected, the first term to be specifically invented for them. So it's kind of interesting here, it's almost like the democratic system emerging almost automatically, you can almost see how this kind of idea of elections em emerging from just the nature of things. Yeah. Sometimes we think it is how, how wonderful it is that we have kind of democratic systems, and, but these democratic systems are so old. They go back to the time of ancient India and ancient Greece. Nobody knows exactly which one is older. But uh, from this it emerges that actually the idea of election seems to be an ancient thing that has always existed in human societies. It is not something that kind of arose anywhere in particular. And that is what we would expect in Buddhism, because everything goes around in circles, uh, always comes back again. Huh? Lord of the fields is the meaning of aristocrat, uh, the second term to be specifically invented. Uh, Lord of the fields, because uh, the pa to understand how this works you have to be able to read Pali, because there is a pun here on the words, you see. So field in Pali is ketta. And aristocrat, one of the four castes, is katya. And katya and ketta is very closely related. Yeah? So that's why lord of the field 
uh, field is said here to be related to Katya. I don't think that's true, it's not really the case, uh, but it's more like uh, an ed what you call an edifying etymology. It's an etymology that is used just to kind of make a point about things. Yeah? So these are the, called the aristocrats, the Katya, the second caste or the first caste of ancient India. And so the castes are appearing. Here is showing again how society now gets divided up. They divide the property, so everyone has private property, private property appearing. Then they start stealing, then they elect somebody, then the castes are gradually appearing. Yeah, the various classes in society. Yeah. They please others with the Dhamma is the meaning of king, the third term to be specifically invented. Dhamena, pare, ranjeti. Ranjeti is like to please someone. And here it is kind of made out that this is the root of Raja, because Raja is king. Raja and Ranjeti supposedly, supposedly related to each other. I don't know, I don't, I don't think that's correct, but it, it is not meant to be a literal etymology. It's meant to be a derivation based on kind of a sensible ideas, if you like. Yeah. And that, Vasettas, is how the ancient traditional terms of the circle of aristocrats were created. Uh, for those very beings, not others. Uh, for those like them, not unlike. Legitimately, not illegitimately. For principle, Vasettas, is the best thing about people in both this life and the next one. Principle is the Dhamma. So the Dhamma is the best for being so in this life and also the next one. Huh? So um, here uh, uh, it just shows you this evolution, how everything came to be. Yeah? And uh, the point of all of this is that, remember, again, we are go have to go back to the very beginning of the Sutta where the Brahmins uh, claim to be superior. Yeah? And what the Buddha is doing us is actually showing how really people evolve. Where do those Brahmins come from? Where do those Kshatriyas come from? And basically saying that we are all equal. It's Dhamma really that matters. And we cannot really distinguish between people. This is the kind of evolution that actually lies behind all of this. So he's trying to kind of demolish the claim of the Brahmins to be special. This is part of this same process that he is talking about here. He's very involved, yeah, to say the least, uh, but uh, that is really what it is about, I think, at this point. Uh, I'll just carry on a little bit longer because I just want to finish this sutta before we take a break. I hope you don't mind. Uh, and then we will just uh, um, maybe have a little bit, we'll just move a little bit forward with everything here. And then some of those beings thought, Oh, how wicked things have appeared among beings, in that stealing is found, and blaming, and lying, and taking up of punishment and banishment. Why don't we set aside the bad and unskillful things? So that's what they did. They set aside bad, unskillful things, and that is the meaning of Brahmin the first term to be specifically invented for them. So here he's saying that the word Brahmin comes from the word Baheti. Baheti means to put something aside. Yeah, Vaheti or Baheti, which means to bar something. And the argument is that is how Brahmin actually arose. Is that possible? Um, maybe, I don't know. The point here, that is, the reason why it seems impossible is because Baheti or Vaheti seems very different from Brahmin. But the language of the suttas at that time may have been slightly different from what it is now. And if you study language in detail, you will know that the word Brahmin at that time might be, have been uh, Bahama instead of Brahmana. Yeah? And I think it's Bahama, ba, something like that. Bahama is closer to the word uh, 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 Baheti, yeah. and that for that reason there may be that link there between the two. Anyway, it's the, it, that is all linguistics, just showing that things are often more complicated than they may seem. Uh, and then they built leaf huts in the wilderness region, where they meditated pure and bright without lighting, cooking fires or digging their soil. Uh, they came down in the morning for breakfast and in the evening for supper to the village, town or royal capital, seeking a meal. In other words, seeking for arms. Yeah? They were arms gatherers, they were like summoners, the early Brahmins. Uh, 
When they had obtained food, they continued to meditate in the leaf huts. When people noticed it, they said, these beings built leaf huts in the wilderness region where they meditate pure and bright without lighting cooking fires or digging their soil. They come down in the morning for breakfast and in the evening for supper to the village, town or royal capitals, seeking a meal. When they have obtained food, they continue to meditate in the leaf huts. They meditate is the meaning of meditator, the second term to be specifically invented for them. The meditator here is Jayaka, yeah, or Jayako. We have a monk in our monastery called Jayako. He's actually from Malaysia. He's a Malaysian monk here from Penang. And um, that is how that term originated, the meditator term. Yeah? So these are the original Brahmins. The point here the Buddha is making is that originally the Brahmins were much better in the old days than they are now. They were still below the Katyas. The Katyas came first. Uh, but they, at least they were pure and they were meditators and doing something worthwhile. But some of those beings were unable to keep up with the meditation in the leaf huts in the wilderness. They came down to the neighborhood of a village or town where they dwelt compiling texts. Yeah? When people noticed this, they said, compiling text, not written text, but oral text that they were compiling. That's what it refers to there. And of course, that is exactly what Brahmins were doing at the time. Uh, at that particular time of the Buddha. Yeah, that's what they were doing, compiling texts. So when people said, noticed this, they said, uh, these beings were unable to keep up with the meditation in the leaf huts in the wilderness. Uh, they came down to the neighborhood of a village or town where they dwelt compiling oral texts. Uh, now they don't meditate. Uh, now they don't meditate is a meaning of reciter, the third term to be specifically invented for them. Uh, and that works because in the Pali, ajayako it means non-meditator and it also means reciter. So these are puns in the Pali language. So you have to understand the Pali background to be able to see that. What was reckoned as lesser at that time, these days is reckoned as better. Yeah? But now these days, the Brahmins look down upon the Samanas. Remember what the point here at the very beginning is the Brahmins are saying bad things about the Samanas, yeah? These shavelings, yeah, these offspring of the Brahma of Brahma's feet. Yeah, they're really saying bad things about the Samanas, although the Samanas are meditating when the Brahmins are just studying texts. But the Buddha is saying originally it was the other way around. Originally the Brahmins were the meditators, yeah, and they looked down upon people who actually studied texts. So all of this is that the Buddha kind of pointing out that if you look at things in the broad picture, things are very different uh, and there's no need for that claim of the Brahmins to think that they are superior. Uh, that is really, that is what this is all about. And part of this is this beautiful parable about the descent of human beings, about how they get corrupted gradually is part of this, uh, this whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, just very briefly, we'll look through the, it will only take a couple more minutes now, I think. Yeah. Some of these beings taking up an active sex life apply themselves to various jobs. Uh, having taken up an active sex life, they apply themselves to various jobs is the meaning of merchant. <laughs> really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> merchant, the term is specifically invented for them. So, the the, the word Vesa is it related to Visu Kama. Visu is like uh, making, be, uh, creating things, yeah, kind of building things, the, the various kinds of jobs. Uh. And that Vasetas is how the ancient tradition, traditional term for the circle of merchant was created. Uh, for those very beings, not others. Uh, for those like them, not unlike. Legitimately, not illegitimately. For principle, Vasetta is the best things for people in both this life and the next life. In other words, the Dhamma is the best for people in this life and the next life. Always coming back to this idea that the Dhamma is the best. Yeah? This is kind of the main point of this whole thing. The Dhamma is what matters, what is righteous, what is good, living a good life. You could say according to the Buddhist teachings, but the word Dhamma is much broader than that. And that is why Adan Sudhartha calls it principle. Any principled living according to morality would be a kind of good Dhamma, a good way to live. The remaining beings lived by hunting and menial tasks. 
My living by hunting and manual task is the meaning of worker, uh, the term specifically invented for them. Uh. And so this is here the Suddha, and uh, the Suddha here is kind of derived from Luddha Chara. Luddha means kind of bloody handed, a uh, hunter. And Kuddha Chara, Kuddha, that's a strange, really, that's been small or something, uh, but uh, anyway, whatever. And that vasetta is how the ancient traditional term for the circle of workers was created. For those very beings, not others. For those like them, not unlike. Uh, legitimately, not legitimately. For the Dhamma is the best thing about people in both this life and the next. There came a time when an aristocrat, Brahmin, merchant and worker, deprecating their own vocation, went forth from the lay life into homelessness. I will be an ascetic. And that vasetta is how, how these four circles were created for those very beings, not for others, for those like them, not unlike, legitimately, not illegitimately. For the Dhamma vasetta is the best thing about those people in both this life and the next life. So here it comes back full circle comes back to the idea how all the four castes go forth in the Dhamma, just like they do at the time of the Buddha, yeah, and then they are equal because they all go forth and they all come together in this Dhamma principle, acting in the righteous way. And then maybe you are creating something good in society. And then the Sutta continues on a little bit, not much more, but it talks about how living righteously, yeah, everyone is basically the same. And in this way, you cannot distinguish between the various castes, castes etc. I think I will, uh, let's read out the rest because it's so short. Might as well read out the rest as well. Uh, an aristocrat, Brahmin, merchant, or worker, or ascetic may do bad things by body, speech, and mind. Uh, they may have wrong view, and they act upon that wrong view. And because of that, uh, when the body breaks up after death, they are reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld and hell. An aristocrat, Brahmin, merchant, worker, or ascetic may do good things by way of body, speech, and mind. Uh, they have right view, they act out of that right view. And because of that, when the body breaks up after death, they are reborn in a good place, in the heavenly realm. An aristocrat, Brahmin, merchant, worker or ascetic, who is restrained in body, speech and mind, and develops the seven qualities that lead to awakening. Yeah, these are the Bodhipakya Dhammas. These are the seven... Uh, I wonder what it is here. Uh, yeah, maybe here it means the seven groups of Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh, uh, whether it means the Bodhipakya Dhamma or the Bojangas, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, it means the qualities that lead to awakening. It doesn't matter which, one, which group it is. Uh, become extinguished in this very life. Uh, any mendicant from these four castes uh, who is perfected with defilements ended, who has completed the spiritual life, done what had to be done, lay down the burden, achieved the true goal, utterly ended the fetter of rebirth, and is utterly freed through enlightenment, is said to be the best by virtue of principle, by virtue of Dhamma, not without Dhamma. For Dhamma, Vasetta, is the best thing about people in this very life and also in the next one. Brahma Sanankumara also spoke this verse. The aristocrat is the best of those people who take clan as the standard, but one accomplished in knowledge and conduct is the best of gods and humans. Knowledge and conduct, vidya chadana sampano, yeah, this is one of the qualities of the Buddha. This is the best among human beings. But if you are attached to a prestige or social status, then the aristocrat is on top. That verse was well sung by Brahma Sunankamara, not poorly sung, well spoken, not poorly spoken, beneficial, not harmful, and I agree with it. I also say the aristocrat is the best of those people who take clan as the standard, but when accomplished in knowledge and conduct is the best of gods and humans. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, Vasetta and Bharadvaja were happy with what the Buddha said. 
So that is the Buddha's reply when the Brahmins claim to be that they are the best caste and everyone else is dodgy and inferior. The Buddha says this. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty an amazing reply, isn't it, to a fairly simple question. And they go through this long kind of roundabout way and looking at the evolution of society and how beings get coarser and, and things. Uh, but I think one of the Main, but one of the main things for me uh, with this suit, there's many, there's many things here that are really nice. One is that we should try to avoid being proud about social status and these kind of things, uh, and we should be accepting of all people. Uh, yeah, this is one of the important points here. When you come into the Sangha, then everyone is basically the same. Uh, we don't distinguish between people whether they are educated or not, poor or rich, high and low social status. All of those things go out of the window, and we try to look after each other as human beings. Uh, this is one of the kind of points here towards the very end. But I think one of the main points here is how important it is to restrain the mind. If we don't restrain ourselves, if we don't try to live according to the Dhamma, to precepts and kindness and all of these kind of things, the natural tendency of the mind is always to become coarser, always coarser. And when we do that, we drag ourselves down. And this dragging of yourself down is what is metaphorically meant by the sutta, how you kind of go down from a very pure state until you're just an ordinary human being. And if you're not careful, you will go even below that at the end of the day. Okay, so there you are, the Aganya Sutta. That was not really meant to be part of this retreat, but now it became part of this retreat. <laughs> so let's have half an hour's break and a cup of tea and everything. We'll see you back again around 4.30 here.